We're returning to the book of Hebrews this morning, chapter number 9. If you have your Bibles, and I trust that you do, we're going to be reading verses 11 through 15, and uh, they will serve as our text for this morning. This chapter starts out describing the first covenant and the ordinances. It describes the very first tabernacle and how it was set up and arranged. They did not decide how the tabernacle was going to be arranged or set up. God told them what to do and how to do it and where to place things. Things were not just placed wherever they thought, boy, this would be decorative. No, God said, this is where that goes, this is where that goes, this is where that goes. They were even told how they were supposed to dress when they came. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Now, as we would study the Old Testament covenant, we discover a major drawback in the symbolism in presenting both gifts and sacrifices that are offered. And in, in this, that they could not cleanse a person's conscience. In other words, the person, even though they brought their sacrifices, even though they brought their offerings, the person still felt guilt and shame. I declare to you this morning that that's the number one plague in our society. Guilt-ridden people. And people who are ashamed. They can't even believe what they've done. Now the age-old problem is this. How in all of that that I've done and all that guilt I carry around, all that shame I carry around, how, how can a person become acceptable to God? especially since that sense of guilt and shame is still attached to their life. And a further problem is, for those have be, who have become acceptable to God, how can a person who has gained access to God continue in the fellowship and the communion with him when mankind knows that they still will break the laws of God? Or even this problem, how can a person not only gain a relationship to God, but how do we maintain that relationship to God? Now, the Bible tells us this. What may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. God has made a, the plan of salvation so plain, so simple, so easy that nobody can miss it. That's what he's really truly saying. It's impossible to miss how simple salvation is. One amen will just work. It's not complicated. We make it complicated and we shouldn't. Coming to Christ is simply this. Lord, I've run my life and it's in ruin. I need you. Here's my life. I surrender. We sang that this morning. I surrender. I make room for you in my life. I surrender. And when I surrender me, I get him. Now, you're saying, well, that sounds really simple. It's the surrender part that's hard, though, isn't it? Uh-huh. Now, the Bible also tells us this, that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. As we read through the Old Testament and as we read through the book of Hebrews, we can learn how God has tried to reach man. We found out in the very first chapter of Hebrews that through the prophets he was trying to reach towards men. We also found out in the, in the first chapter that he has sent angels to try and draw men to him. In chapter 3, we found that he had great leaders and those great leaders were to bring people to, to, to God. And then in chapter 4, we learned about through the priest in the priesthood that people were brought into Christ. And then in chapter number 8, we learn about the covenants and the laws and, and, and the fact that we have a high priest. And all of that had not brought us to a place in Christ. But all of these approaches are, were imperfect and incomplete. As the prophets and the angels and the leaders and the priests, the covenants and the laws were only attempts at the faint copies of what or who was needed. 
All the covenants, rituals, ceremonies, sacrifices did not bring man to God, nor did, they, did the covenants or the rituals, the ceremonies or the sacrifices make us or them acceptable to God, nor can they give us a fellowship with God. Only Christ Jesus can bring us near and make us acceptable to God. Methinks that the point of this passage of Scripture is to show that Christ Jesus is greater and more perfect minister and mediator and high priest than we could ever possibly believe. I state again, Christ is the only minister who can bring us to God. All earthly ministers can point the way, but they cannot bring you to God. In fact, we do not come on our own. We only come through Christ. Now, I want us to read our text this morning, if you'll join me, and I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will. We're in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and we are in verses 11 through 15. But Christ came, notice this word here, as. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance." When I read this, this little song goes off in my, in my mind. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. He paid the debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Praise the name of the Lord. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you this morning so very, very much for your words of encouragement to us this day. Lord, there will also be words of challenge. So, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak through me today and that, Lord, I'll be moved aside so that this, your people, Father, will hear the truth of your word. And, Lord, they will accept that word, not because of the words I'm speaking, but because of the word that the Spirit is speaking to their hearts and to their lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this group of people. Thank you for the redemption you have brought to their lives. Now, Father, help us to maintain, Father, through Christ, our relationship to you. And we give you thanks now for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. I hope it'll be okay if I take my jacket off. It's always warm up here. (laughs) Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you. She's also going to bring me some water. Thank you. What this passage of Scripture says to us in the beginning here is that Christ does not minister from an earthly tabernacle. He does not offer the blood of bulls or goats or calves which cannot take away our sin. 
In essence, bringing the sacrifice for sin was the only an acknowledgement of the fact that a person had sinned. Christ ministers in the holy place in heaven. What we learned from last week and in chapter 8 is that there is a sanctuary of heaven and where he has offered his true atonement of his own blood, which brings eternal redemption, not only concealing our sin, but freeing us from the guilt and the shame of our sin. That makes me just want to shout. The guilt and the shame, gone. Hallelujah. The problem is, is that we hang on to it. We remember, and God's already forgotten. We sometimes even remind God, you know, well, you know what I did. And God is saying, really? What, what did you do? Let it be gone. Whatever that shame, I don't care if it's this past week or two years ago. Father, in the name of Jesus, let it be gone. Hmm. Hmm. He has brought to us an eternal redemption. Not in just canceling our sin, but freeing us from the guilt and from the shame of our sin. What I mean by eternal redemption is, is his redemption for mankind is always in effect. It is eternal. For every person who confesses their sin and repents in turning to Christ, they will be redeemed. Christ has made atonement once for all and does not have to make a daily atonement as earthly priests or ministers had to do. Christ found and, uh, founded and obtained for man the only method of salvation, that of taking man's place and dying in his stead. The redemption price stands good forever. It is eternal. It is a merit and it is effective. The redemption would be for all time. Christ died once for all. Even if no one ever received it, even if no one tried to keep it, it would still stand for redemption. But understand that there are certain conditions one must meet to be acceptable to God and to keep the fellowship and the communion alive. Our rescue, our release, and our restoration was granted upon the receipt of the, of the ransom price, which is the atonement of Christ's blood. The blood of animals, the rites and the ceremonies, the sin offerings, set the body apart, ceremonially purifying the flesh of defilement, which allowed a person to admit or be readmitted to public worship and a freedom from temporary uh, punishment of the law. But how much more shall the blood of Christ, through the renewal of the Holy Spirit, purge our conscience, our guilt and our shame from sin and make us inwardly holy before God? The rituals of the law only cleanse the body, the flesh, but the blood of Christ cleanses the soul, cleanses the spirit, cleanses the heart, cleanses the mind, and reconciles us to God. Because of what Christ has provided in himself, he is the mediator of the new covenant, that through his death and resurrection, our sins can be remitted and mankind can be given an eternal inheritance. Think about this one element of the internal inheritance. Jesus said this, so I'm on good ground. I, if I go away, I will prepare a place for you, and I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Yes. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. You're still all just sitting down. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the word of God to you this morning. Jesus said, if I go away, I'm coming back. And I, I believe, even as Brother Terry mentioned earlier to us, I, I believe that's closer today than it was yesterday. One of these days, it's going to be the day. One of these days, it's going to be the time. He's going to shout, we're going to go. Hallelujah. Think, think about 
Well, let me just say this. I would say that that scripture wraps up the whole idea of eternal inheritance. Christ came as our high priest. Now, hopefully you remember that I have said this because I'm going to repeat it again. Christ didn't come into the world to become the Savior. He came into the world because he is the Savior. So it follows that he did not come into the world to become the Redeemer. He came into the world because he is the Redeemer. Christ didn't come into the world to become our healer. He came into the world because he is our healer. And Christ did not come into the world to become our high priest. He came into the world because he is our high priest. Jesus came into this world, wasn't to become anything because he already is everything. First John, for me, qualifies this. He says, who has the Son has life, and this life is in his Son. Christ didn't come into the world to bring mercy, but he, was, but he who has Christ has a life of mercy. And the same, he didn't come into the world to bring grace, but he who has Christ has a life of grace. Christ is everything. Eternal life is not possible apart from a true relationship in Christ. For the life of salvation, the life of, of redemption, the life of healing, the life of mercy, the life of grace, etc., that God gives is only available in Christ Jesus. I believe the Bible says it this way. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Or how about this verse? No man comes unto the Father except through him. And there is no other name given to men whereby men might be saved. And no one can come to the Father except in, not through, in Christ Jesus. So that leads us to the understanding no earthly sanctuary or no earthly worship can make a person acceptable to God. You can't even become acceptable to God by coming to, becoming a church member or being baptized as a baby. For our, our practice of water baptism cannot make us acceptable to God. Nothing we do or do not do makes us acceptable to God. The Bible says, says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God. So only Christ's blood, as a symbol of life, has been shed for the redemption of the world. That would make us acceptable to God. And only his blood applied to our life causes us to inherit the kingdom of God. We do not inherit the kingdom of Christ on earth. We inherit the kingdom of God in heaven, which is eternal. The body, the flesh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So that there has to be a, transforma or a, a transition to life and a transformation into his likeness and a transfiguration to glory all by the transfusion of Christ's blood into the inheritance of the kingdom of God. We call this act of Christ our regeneration and remission of sin. In other words, we have become new, a new creation. Hallelujah. You're new. You're new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We spoke in chapter 8 last week about Christ being the minister of this heavenly sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary is for the worship, the praise, and the prayer just as the earthly sanctuary is for that. However, there are some differences, such as this. See, the earthly sanctuary is only a type of, true, of the true sanctuary, which is in heaven. What we do here in this sanctuary is only in preparation for what their heavenly sanctuary holds for us. Sometimes people have said to me over there, well, there's just too much shouting. You're going to hate heaven. I'm serious, you're going to hate it. Because it ain't quiet up there. 
I know we have this picture in mind. Boy, I'm going to be sitting on the front porch of my thing, and I'm just going to rock away, and everything's going to be great. No, that, that's not a picture at all that comes in the, in, from the Scripture. It is a place of rejoicing. It is a place where there is shouts of praise unto he who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hmm. See, the truth of the matter is we're just warming up. I hope you are. See, in the heavenly sanctuary, can I use the word worship center? You know I have this imagination, and I know the Bible doesn't say this, so you're just taking my, 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 my little thoughts, my imagination, okay? But I somehow see in heaven that there's this great, huge tabernacle, temple, bigger than you can imagine in your life. And it's a place where people go every day. I know there's no day or night in heaven, but every, every, time, every opportunity they want, they can go to that place, and it's just filled with worship, just filled with praise. It's just, it's just unbelievable what's going on in that sanctuary in heaven. I think it's a worship center. I think they even have a life center. Well, we're going to have a banquet at some particular point, and I would think that's probably where they're going to have it is in the life center of that tabernacle. I know, just my opinion, just my imagination. The heavenly sanctuary, the worship center, has a perfect priest. That's the difference between their sanctuary and ours. The minister, the high priest, the king, the mediator in the heavenly sanctuary was fully man and he is fully God. He didn't come from among mere men. The minister of the heavenly sanctuary is the Son of God himself, and as the Son of God, he is perfect. And in his priestly ministerial position, he is able to make intercession with mercy and grace for us. The heavenly sanctuary, the worship center, the, uh, the worship there is truly perfectly spiritual, perfectly holy, and perfectly pure because the spiritual perfect sanctuary is in the perfect spiritual world of heaven it is a place where the presence of God is glorified and manifested for all to see and all to experience can't you just wait to get there oh you're not you're not looking like you're that excited about that whole thing can't you just wait to get there and you just imagine stepping into the holiness and the purity and the righteousness of God. And you got there because of the holiness, righteousness, and purity of Christ in your life. And as a result of it being in your life, you qualified for being there. And now you're going to step into this gigantic temple, if you will, this worship center that's there. And worship God openly and freely. Nobody's going to think you're weird. <laughs> wow. And the reason in the heavenly sanctuary, the worship center, we worship the perfect sacrifice, Christ. There is in this sanctuary, Christ does not offer sacrifice. A, a mediation of the blood of animals for our sin offering, there's an intercession before the Lord. His sacrifice of his own blood is honored by the Father in intercession for our sins. Because as our minister uh, in the heavenly sanctuary, he bore our guilt, he bore our shame, he, built, he, he bore our burden, he, uh, he bore our judgment for the sins that we had committed. Christ entered the Holy of Holies. Christ only had to make one sacrifice, and that sacrifice stands forever. It's on the wall. It's on the wall, and it stands forever. It will forever stand for the very fact he made a sacrifice once for all, and every person who accepts that sacrifice can be redeemed by God. Whew. 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 Hmm. You know that sacrifice, that symbol of the sacrifice is for every man in every generation. 
the worship and the praise and the prayer, the intercession of the sanctuary in heaven is because Christ Jesus obtained the redemption for us. He, he redeemed our sins, our death, our condemnation, making it possible for man to be freed and delivered. He has made it possible for you to be rescued. He made it possible for you to be released. See, it's one thing to be rescued from your sin. Oh, man, Lord, I don't have to pay for my sin. You paid for it. Thank you. That's one thing. But God wants us to take the next step of being released. It no longer has a hold on me. I don't even think about the sin. It can't be, it can't be tempted by Think of the freedom and liberty there is. When you get to that place in Christ where you are so released that if the devil steps in front of you to tempt you, you go, so? What's that with me? But then God says, oh, I want to take it one more step. I want there to be a restoration to what I want you to become with the life I gave you. See, it was a perfect redemption that saves us perfectly. This cleansing, this purging, this washing by his blood goes deep within a man's conscience. It is the righteousness of of Christ's blood that cleanses our conscience. Therefore, it is God's desire to forgive man's sins who confesses their sin and repents in turning by faith to Christ. And through Christ's righteousness, nothing can ever stop him from forgiving you. Did you catch that this morning, church? Through Christ's righteousness, nothing can ever stop him from forgiving you. All you have to do is ask. I just want to run around the building a little. The power of what the word is telling us. See, God will always forgive our sins for Christ's sake. Matthew 26, 28 says, For this is my blood and of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission, the redemption, the forgiveness of sin. His blood sacrifice on the cross secured the remission and the ransom and the redemption for sin. And that blood applied to our lives transforms us away from the darkness of our sin and brings us into eternal life. Hmm. You see... We haven't just been brought out of our sin. We haven't just been rescued from it. We haven't just been released from it. We haven't just been restored to the new life. What has happened is that we have come into a special relationship, a covenant relationship with God. This is it. This is the covenant. God's written it out for us. It's there. It's not a covenant of one who is dead. Oh, yes, Jesus died. <laughs> but it was just to set the covenant securely in place. But he is alive forevermore. We live under the living will and testament covenant. In the resurrection of Christ, he is appointed the administrator of the covenant, which is his work as a mediator. He is the executor of God's will and testament. See, the security of the covenant comes from his sacrificial death, his life-giving resurrection, which serves to underline the very character of the new covenant. 1 John 5 says this, These things I have written unto you, that you may know that you have eternal life even unto all that believe in the name of the Son of God. This verse leads us to believe the eternal life is found only in Christ. I would believe this verse to also speak of God's eternal keeping power, our eternal divine sonship, and our eternal communion with God. John wrote this, but as to many as to have received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, even to all those who believe on his name. 
This verse serves to assure the permanent place we have in the life of Christ to be manifested by his sonship into us. The spirit, that, that covenant nature of this new life is to men to receive Christ so as to make God's sons, make of us God's sons and daughters. The power of salvation is Christ in our hearts. Thank you for a few nods. Okay, you're encouraging me. The power of salvation is Christ in my heart. It's not just a matter of praying a salvation prayer. Now, I know we do that, and we're probably always going to do that till Jesus comes back. But the real transformation, the real salvation comes when Christ's nature comes and lives inside of me. Now I'm saved. What follows from that is sonship. There is no higher elevation or position but that of being a son of God. That sonship is guaranteed by the covenant of God. Now, now we know whether we have received or not the salvation of Christ. Everybody in this room knows whether or not you have received the spirit, the nature of Christ in your life. You know whether you have. It's not about the prayer. Is Christ living in your life? That's, the, that's how you know. Is Christ living? And there's not one person in this sanctuary, this building, or across the street from this church that doesn't know whether they have or haven't. I'm going to explain in just a moment why. Our sonship is guaranteed by the covenant. And we know whether or not we have received or not. Every person already knows if they have placed their faith in Christ, redemptive work on the cross. If we have placed our faith in Christ's sacrifice, if we have allowed the Holy Spirit to apply the blood of Jesus into our life, then we have God's written covenant, and then we have eternal life in Christ. And we have the assurity that our sins are forgiven and forgotten. which makes us the children of God. And not, not only do we have the written covenant, but we, he also sends the Holy Spirit to confirm. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, he says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's why I said to you just a few moments ago, everybody knows whether they have or haven't. Because either the Spirit this morning has, has confirmed in your heart and life that you are a son of God, or it is not confirming that you are. And everybody knows in themselves whether they are or aren't. So the Spirit bears witness to our spirit, but he also bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. That's another thing that makes the baptism of the Holy Spirit so powerful in our lives, as he is the, wit the inner witness of who we are in Christ. We have received the power to inherit eternal life. The covenant, the testament of God, describes how a person becomes acceptable to God through Christ. The covenant of God describes how we maintain a relationship with God, and it's through Christ. So the problem of how do we become acceptable to God or how do we maintain our relationship to God, the answer is very simple. In one person, Christ Jesus. Christ's atonement was once for all. He was the redemption price. Christ paid the way for us to be acceptable to God and to maintain our relationship with God so Christ's atonement stands firm forever when Jesus was on the cross the end of his earthly life as we knew it he said these words it is finished your rescue is finished in Christ your release is finished in Christ our restoration is finished in Christ. 
as Christ as the mediator and the executor of the covenant of God guaranteed that his work on the cross and our belief in his name will reconcile us to God. Now let me close with just a couple more thoughts. Christ did not come into the world just to rescue man from sin. Many people believe, uh, view Christ as a rescuer, okay? They, when, when, boy, whenever something's going on that they can't handle, they're, they're quick to come to church and they're quick to ask people to pray and, and so on and so forth. They're, 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 they're right ready for, for praying then. But God is not just, Christ is not just a rescuer. Oh, yeah, he can rescue us from trouble. And he can rescue us from hell. And he can rescue us from consequences. Yes, he can do all of that. But for salvation to be true, there is needed to be a release. I would believe that the greatest thing in the universe is that our release through his redemption. Christ came into time to rescue and release his own inheritance. There is releasing from the bondage of sin upon the receipt of his ransom blood into our lives. So Christ's redemption does not just rescue us from the slavery and the mentality of sin alone, but there is a release to live in the freedom from sin, and yet there is also the restoration to a new life in Christ Jesus and a reconciliation to God. Oh, hallelujah. Worship team, if you'll come back, please. If you haven't guessed it, I love to preach about Christ and his covenant. It's my desire through the simplicity of my preaching that every one of us will fully understand the depth and the height and the width of the covenant that God has written for us. And that we all will understand the truth of the covenant. We are acceptable to God through Christ. Please don't misunderstand this this morning. Now, I know I'm speaking to most of you who already, you've made this decision for Christ in life. I, I got it. I get it. I understand it. But boy, I don't want us to miss the very, the very basics of this. Our acceptability to God is only through Christ. I can't be good enough. I don't have enough in me to be good enough. Neither do you. But the Christ in me does. I trust that forever we will understand the truth of the covenant and understand that that acceptability is through Christ alone. You've heard people ask this question. Well, if you were standing before God, what one reason would you give him to allow you into heaven. Christ. That's the answer to that question. There's no other acceptability for heaven except Christ. It's in him and in him alone. Our relationship to God is maintained through our relationship in Christ. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would please. I'm just going to ask you to stay in your place right where you are this morning. I just want you to bow your heads and I want you just to shut yourself in with God for a moment or two. I just want us to just to wait upon the Lord for a moment here. Let the Holy Spirit confirm to you through the whole work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Christ is in you. No, Christ isn't. Let him confirm it to you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mm, hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, I would pray this morning that you would search our hearts today. Lord, I would even challenge you to, to try us in knowing our thoughts. Lord, would you show us in ourselves 
if there is any wicked way in us. Lord, I even pray today, right now, Father, is where we stand, and each of us stands before you. No, we didn't come to the altar, but Lord, we've made an altar right where we're standing. And so, Lord, right now, I'm asking you to cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Lord, we're inviting you to open our heart that we might receive the conviction and the confirmation of his spirit. God, we would ask for your help, your direction. Lord, we would ask for your forgiveness. We would ask for your healing. As we stand before you this morning, knowing that your redemption and your reconciliation is greater than we deserve. His blood is greater than all our sins.